Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning again. So, I want to say something, but I'm afraid I'll get in trouble. <laughs> so, but I'm already in trouble. Dude, you over 60 crowd, y'all are like some tough people. You're the only ones here. I mean, like, I don't know if you're just trying to stick it to me because I said that in that video, but man, y'all bless me. You really do. Um, so yeah, wanna was just handed a note that uh, uh, if you uh, need any food or if you know anybody in the community that needs food, Jim and Denise and their team have plenty of food and are willing to deliver that. So uh, get in contact with them. And if you don't have their contact information, I can be the go-between and I'll funnel that to them. Thank you and God bless your whole team. Also, yeah, it, it, yeah, and so it's up here. So yeah, you can come up to the church as well. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. So um, we've been in a series uh, this month. If you've been around, called "Of First Importance," we've been focusing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We've been launching that out of First Corinthians fifteen three, for where Paul wrote, "For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance: that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures; that He was." buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. If you were here two weeks ago I gave an intro to that to that series and then David uh, did an outstanding job last week talking about the significance of the death of Christ and today was going to be the day where I talked to you about the significance of Christ being buried and I had spent uh, weeks preparing for today's message and I had a lot of interesting um teaching points about the significance of why Christ had to be buried, why he just didn't die and then was raised like two seconds later. And I, I told Edward this week, we've been in contact. I know y'all can't contact him, but we, we, we still talk. And, uh, and, and I was telling him, I was like, man, this is difficult for me because this is like teaching. And I've never seen myself as a teacher. I'm more of a motivational, inspirational guy. But this is like teaching, like, and this is some really cool stuff. Um, but then... This week happened, and it has been a very, very stressful week, especially the last four days as this thing has escalated and escalated and escalated. Um, your staff and your elders have really been working hard. We've been talking to other churches. We've been talking to health professionals. We've been doing a lot of different things, and uh, if you were on Facebook I don't even know what day that was now. Friday, you saw me completely botch three Facebook Live videos. Like, I could not have done a worse job on those Facebook Live videos. And we're in the room filming those, and we're like, oh, we got to delete that one and do another one. Oh, we got to delete that one and do another one. Oh, we got to delete that one and do another one. And so finally, we just said, look, I'll just videotape it. That way we can edit it. We'll get something out. But I say all that to say that, you know, a friend told me in high school, Jake, if you can't make fun of yourself, just make fun of other people. Well, now that I'm a Christian, I can't do that. So I just make fun of myself. And so I thought it was great comedy relief 
that the leader of your church in the month of March cannot even do a Facebook Live video correctly. And I'm telling you, I spent that night making fun of myself and teasing myself, and I found some relief in the midst of chaos. And so, again, I'm so thankful for our elders. I'm so thankful for our staff. I'm so thankful for everybody that was able to pull this off uh, so that we can meet. Now, if you're like me, you're trying to figure this out. All right. If you're not like me and you're not trying to figure this out and you're not worried about it, amen. I'm not really, really worried about it. It's it's really funny deal. For those of you that know anything about the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 6, which means I think the world, like the sky is falling. Like my motto is an Enneagram 6 is who cares if the glass is half full or half empty? It's going to break anyway, right? I mean, that's how I li I've lived my life for 46 years. And so maybe, just maybe, somebody asked me one time and said, Jake, I cannot believe you are not freaking out over this coronavirus stuff. I mean, you freak out about everything. And I was like, okay, one of two things is happening here. Either A, I've been preparing myself for this my whole life by freaking out over the little things. Now that the big thing is here, I can handle it. Or B, maybe I'm just tired. <laughs> maybe I'm just tired of worrying about everything. Maybe I'm just tired and maybe God has brought me to a place. Maybe it's because Edward's gone. And I have to step up and do all of these things. But I stand here today and I'm in that sort of that tension of, yeah, I'm concerned, but you know what? I'm not. And yeah, I know the reality that, of what's going on, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not at a place where I want to shut down yet. That could change tomorrow. And so many of you may be caught in this same tension. You may be on, on the extreme of, man, you're, you're fearful, and rightfully so. And, and you know, we, we teach in the Crucible Project that your emotions are real. Your emotions are real. They're not good. They're not bad. They just are. If you're excited, don't, you can't deny that. You're excited. There's something that's exciting you. And if you're fearful right now, that's a real emotion. And so we don't discredit that and we don't discount that. If you're happy, you're happy. It just is what it is. But what do we do with that? And so if you're on this extreme, if you're on this extreme, if you don't know what to do, then I say welcome. All of you is welcomed. Every part of you is welcomed at the cross of Christ. And I know God wants to minister to you this morning. You know, it's interesting that today was going to be the day that we talked about the significance of the burial of Christ. Because the more I wrestled and the more I prayed and some of my devotions that popped up on my Bible plan centered around two passages that I cannot shake. And we'll get to those in just a minute. Because here's the reality of what's going on in our country right now and even in East Texas. Our, we, have, we, we have stuff being taken away. Like how many of you know me? Like you really think you know me? Nobody. Great. So let me fill you in. <laughs> Let me fill you in on a couple of things about me, all right? I love Tex-Mex food, thank you, <laughs> specifically chimichangas, my favorite food. I think it's the greatest food ever invented. Yep, thank you, Daryl. Uh, I love my family. I probably should reprioritize that. I love my family and then Tex-Mex food, all right? I love mowing the grass. Oh, we know that. So you do know me. All right. And then I schedule my calendar around sporting events. Oh, I am a sports fanatic. You know what's not going on right now? Sports. Baseball. Baseball gone. NBA, gone. March Madness, gone. All right. UIL, my son's track season, gone for now. All right. What am I doing with that? We got word yesterday, schools have been closed. Where am I going to send my kids? I got to, not only are you confined, not only am I quarantined, being quarantined is one thing. Being quarantined with your kids, a whole nother story. Amen. All right. Gatherings canceled. 
and, and the reality is, and it breaks my heart, but, it, but I know why they're doing it. And because I've, I've heard from some of these people this week, some people are being forced to stay home because of their immune deficiencies and things of that nature. And so it brought me to a couple of passages because I believe this is very symbolic of a burial season. And you'll see where I'm going this just a second. Psalms 23 is the first one God led me to this week. Preach this at funerals all the time. And it's just, it's, it's just interesting. God brought me here this week because of the whole where we've been in this series. We talked about death last week and the significance of Jesus dying on the cross. And we were supposed to be talking about burial today. And just with everything's going on. And God just kept reminding me of this. This is a burial season. It really is. And just, just track with me for just a little while. Very familiar passage, Psalms 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell on the house of the Lord forever. I want to make two important points from this psalm that God has just overwhelmed me with this week. In one version of that psalm, of that psalm in verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. One version says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's what one version says. I think that's very interesting. There's two things that jump out at me through this passage that I think is very applicable today. Two words, through and shadow. Through and shadow. It says, even though I walk through the valley. You know, I find it very interesting that he says, that he does not say that we are walking in a valley. It's very important. Because whether we're talking about the death of a loved one, where, where most of the times we hear this psalm is at funerals. Or whether we're talking about um, the burial season that we're in now. No sports. For now, I can still get Tex-Mex. I mean, that may change. I don't know. No gatherings, no school. Just this season of burial that we're in. It would be very different if, if we were in a season of burial. Much like Jesus was buried, but we know the end of the story, right? Sunday came. He didn't stay in the grave. So it's almost like Jesus wasn't in the grave. He was just passing through the grave. Does that make sense? And I think we need to be reminded that wherever this goes, however long this lasts, this is not, we are not in a crisis. We are passing through a season. And that is so important because when you pass through something, it guarantees that you will get to the other side. Jesus' burial did not last. There was a Sunday coming where he was going to be out of that grave. This too shall pass. When? I don't know. How? I don't know. But I am confident that in this season, this is just another example of walking through something. Through means we will get to the other side. Sunday's coming. If you go into the context of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Friday was brutal. Saturday was dark. But guess what? Sunday came. And I think for many of us, myself included, this week was crazy. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it almost felt like a descent into darkness of what is going on. And now I think that we're kind of, and this may not be the end. We may still go a little bit lower. I don't know. I have a feeling, though, at some point we'll level off and we'll be, if we are not already in that burial season where we just wait. And what do we do when we wait? You know, 
there's a lot of theology debate about what Jesus was doing while he was buried. Lord, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> I want to focus on what happened on Sunday. And I'm going to be giving you some challenges at the end of this message that will hopefully give you some hope while we're in this season. Okay, because we don't know how long it's going to last. And so my main point, this first point, is I just want you to understand, we are not in a crisis right now as Christians. Christians, we know Jesus. We have hope in Jesus. We are not in a crisis. We are passing through a crisis. Much like the psalmist says that even though he passes through the valley. But here's the second thing. That word shadow. It's interesting that the psalmist did not say he was passing through the valley of death. It's very interesting. He said he was passing through the valley of what? The shadow of death. You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what the difference is between death and the shadow of death? Well, much like what's the difference between your tangible body and the shadow that you see? I can see my shadow right there. What causes a shadow? There's only one thing that can cause a shadow. It's the illumination of light. When light hits an object, it forms a shadow. Walking through, not the valley of death, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. What does that mean? Well, Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection conquered death. Conquered hell. Conquered the grave. And when Jesus conquered death, death no longer remained. The only thing that remained of death was its shadow because the light of Christ conquered it. Amen? Amen. Jesus' light conquered death. And the facts are that anytime there's a shadow, there must be light. And so church, I'm here to encourage you. Not only are we not walking in a crisis, but through a crisis, but we're not really walking into a crisis of death, of depression, of despair. We're walking through something that has already been conquered through Jesus Christ. And if we will accept that the same light that Jesus had is the same light that lives in us, we can illuminate into a world that is fearful right now and cast shadows on what Jesus has already conquered. Amen? So what do we do with this? I really do think this is a reminder for all of us that not only are we in a burial season right now, but we've had other burial seasons in our lives. And you know what? Lord willing, if I get to live another 30, 40 years, I'll have more burial seasons in my life. And so what do we do with these burial seasons? Acts chapter 9 was the second passage I was reminded of this week. Paul's conversion. Many of you know the story of Paul. Uh, Saul who uh, persecuted the church and then um, he gets uh, saved. He meets Jesus and then becomes the greatest missionary the world's ever known. It's very interesting. Next chapter 9. I want to read this, this story. I want to read this account of, of Paul's conversion because there's one particular thing I want to point out. Starting in verse 1. Luke records, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, here it comes, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul's answer in verse 5, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. Stop right there. Don't put up that, that next slide just yet. And so Saul's going out to persecute Christians. He's going to go round them up. He's got an agenda, right? All of a sudden, his agenda gets interrupted. Jesus meets him on the road and knocks him down. And when he comes to, he can't see. But he's given some specific instructions. All right. Verse 9. I don't know why this never popped out at me until now. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. A burial season for Paul. Think about that. He wasn't radically saved and then the very next minute changing the world. He had three days where he couldn't see, he couldn't eat, and he couldn't drink. Why? Well, if you read the rest of the story, God, Jesus, appears to a man named Ananias and tells him, hey, there's going to be this guy. He's laying in this bed. He's blind. I need you to go over there and lay your hands on him, pray for him. And we know if we read the end of that story, once that happened, the scales fell from Paul's eyes. He could see again. He spent some time with the disciples learning, and then he started his ministry very interesting. Paul's season of burial. Now, what was Paul doing those three days as he was laying there? I don't know. But I know there's a lesson in here for us, much like in Psalms 23. Uh, Paul had an agenda. How many of you had an agenda when you woke up Monday of what your week was going to look like? Okay, I did too, and my week looked nothing like that. How many of you had an agenda for later this month? Maybe for the first of April. Maybe for the middle of April. And now already that agenda has changed because of something outside your circumstance. Yeah. Paul had an agenda and that agenda was interrupted. But instead of just immediately switching to a new agenda, the Lord allowed him to have a burial season for three days. I'm wondering, church... If the Lord is allowing us to have a season of burial. Not, not that we go insignificant. Not that we disappear. Not that we hide. But our agendas have been interrupted. And now we've got to figure out what are we going to do now? What are we going to do next? Where are we going to go? If I can't do this, then what am I going to do instead? And I believe the Lord is allowing this season of burial and we have a choice. What are we going to choose to do with it? What are we going to choose to do in this season where we are walking through some chaos? Are we going to choose to wallow in the fact that we're in chaos or are we going to choose to realize that it's not death, it's not this, it's not that, it's just the shadow in the same light of Christ that was uh, raised again on the third day that cast shadow on, or cast the light on death is the same light that lives in us. So can we choose to believe that and use this season for good? I would encourage you that we more than ever during this time need to be that light and beacon of hope to our communities, to our families. That the church now needs to really shine. But for us to do that, maybe each one of us individually needs to take a step back and allow the burial season to happen. Like, what is it, Lord, that you want to teach me over the next day, two days, three days? Paul had three days. Jesus had three days. I don't know how long we have. But what is it, God, you want to do in me? Because here's what's happening. There's a lot of energy right now being cast out at people who don't think and believe the way we do about this virus. That needs to stop. 
And we need to look inward at ourselves and say, God, you have canceled this. You have allowed this to be canceled. You have allowed this to be canceled. You have allowed this to be canceled. You have allowed these things to happen. You have allowed my visitations with my dad to be canceled. What is it you are wanting to do in me? And then how can I take that and minister to the people in this community that need you the most? And then the last thing I would challenge you with is this. There's a verse that hangs on my wife's mirror that, uh, man, I, I mean, ever since we lived in, the, in, in Weeping Willow, it's been there. And uh, she got it at a Bible study one time, and I think it's applicable for today. It's Isaiah 26 and 3. It says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast and trust in you. Where has your mind been focused the last few days? CNN, Fox News, ABC, NBC, Twitter, Facebook. I'm just going to be honest with you. Up until yesterday, that's where my mind was. And was it any wonder there was no peace? <laughs> yesterday, I shut down the news and we started watching like funny movies, like old Disney movies. And then I had my laptop out and I just started meditating on you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast in you. And I began to focus my thoughts and my mind and my actions on God. And he began to show me that, Jake, this is just a season. I'm going to do something in you, in Summit, in the church universal during this season. Be ready for it. And so I close with this, and I know the band's freaking out because I'm closing early. But I do want to worship. We're going to sing another song. But here's what I do want to close with. There was one piece of news I did pick up on yesterday. <clears throat> the president has declared today be a national day of prayer. And so I'm going to close us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing this last song, and then you're going to be dismissed. And, I'm, and, and, and I want you to go, I want you to spend some time today in prayer. I want you to spend some time today in prayer. But here's, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Because if you're like me, you're going to go home and you're going to start praying for all of these people in your life. And I'm not saying that you don't do that. That's, I mean, we, we need to do that. I'm very worried about my dad right now. So I've been, I've been praying a lot for him. But I want you to spend some time today praying about what God is wanting to do in you specifically during this season. Because I don't believe that any of this is, happens by chance. That he has something for each and every one of us. Alright? Let's pray. Father God, I'm reminded of a few things this morning. Number one, I'm reminded of how good you are. How holy and how wonderful and how majestic how powerful how loving, how gracious, how merciful you are. Number two, I'm reminded that we do live in a sinful and fallen world. And if it's, I mean, if it's not coronavirus, it would be something else. I'm reminded of the many times in my own personal life <laughs> where I thought the world was going to end or the sky was falling or things will never be the same. Woe is me. Half of that stuff I can't even remember. I'm reminded of the real emotion of fear and that it's real. I'm reminded that we should be fearful in a healthy way. But I'm also reminded, Father, that when fear begins to cripple us, does not honor you. God, we need to step into that. Learn something about ourselves. Learn something about you. 
And so, Father, on this national day of prayer, we come before you and we ask that you open our hearts, that you speak to us, that you show us something about ourselves, that you make us mindful of what you're doing in the world. you make us mindful of those around us that may not feel the same way we do. I pray for our leaders. Obviously our leaders uh, of our country, state officials, the pressure that they're under to make decisions. But I pray for our leaders here too. God, we've got some decisions we need to make this week. We want to be wise. We want to be in the center of your will. And finally, God, I pray that when we leave these doors and that we go out to wherever we're going, that we would carry the light of Christ. And that everybody that we come in contact with, Father, that they would literally see Jesus. And they would see a hope in us that can only be explained by the goodness of God. So, Father, as we sing this last song, may your Holy Spirit rain down on us. May we worship you. I invite those of you that are at home right now watching on Facebook Live to stand up or to sit down and to pour your hearts out in worship as well. And the same Holy Spirit that is present here is present with you wherever you are. And so, Father, we glorify you, we worship you, we give you honor, and we give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.